Hello, my name is Arnold Delorme, and this is part four of a series of video on time frequency analysis of EEG time series. This part is about intertrial coherence, which is also called phase locking factor. This is a relatively short video. Here are three trials, one in red, one in blue, and one in green, with different phase alignments. On the left, the phase is different and the peaks do not align. On the right, the phase is similar and the peak align. This is reflected in the ERP averages. On the left, the ERP is almost flat, while on the right, we observe several peaks. It's important to note that the spectral power is identical, or almost identical, because spectral power simply looks at the average oscillation amplitude. This amplitude is independent of the phase of the signal in single trials. Since power cannot provide us with information about the synchronization of the trials, what can we do? Well, we can complete, compute what we call intertrial coherence. This measure was pioneered by Talon Baudry and collaborators in 1996, although they used a different name, the phase locking factor. Then Scott McKaig coined the term intertrial coherence a few years later. This is a signal in red and the corresponding phaser at the dominant frequency of the signal. The orientation of the vector uh, depends on the phase of the signal at time t, and the length depends on the amplitude of the signal. Now let's have a look at another trial. The green trial has a larger amplitude compared to the red, and the phase is shifted by 90 degrees. The third purple trial has a smaller amplitude compared to the red and is shifted by uh, 180 degrees. Computing spectral power consists in taking the average of the square of the vector length or vector amplitude, and we've done that before. Now what is new here is that we can also ignore the amplitude information and simply average three vectors of length one, so average the normalized phase vectors. This is what's done here. This is the average vector in white, and its length or magnitude tells us whether the different trials have the same phase, and its orientation indicates the dominant uh, phase. Now, let's go back to our first example. You can see that in the first case on the left, the phase of the single trials are, are not aligned. Uh, in this case, the phase of the vector will be random and the average of the normalized phase vector will have a small magnitude or length. In this case, the length is 0 0.05, with 1 being the maximum length. Now, on, on, on the right, uh, this is different. Now, the phase are relatively aligned and the length of the average phase vector is 0 0.8 or 80%. This is the value of the intertrial coherence. It's an indicator of phase synchronization between trials. Since trial onset usually depends on the presentation of a stimulus, this is a, a measure indicating how a stimulus leads to phase resynchronization in the EEG. I'm going to provide an example here. This is ten the standard event-related potential or ERP model. In this model, the EEG single trial is equal to the average plus some background noise. This means that the ITC should always be close to one with perfect synchronization of the phase in single trials. It also means that the background EEG noise is not affected by the presentation of the stimulus. Here is a famous example showing that that's not the case. This is the EEG alpha ringing phenomenon that sometimes occur for non-target trials in visual tasks. This is the ERP image with trials sorted with increasing phase this ERP image only contains trials with high alpha power. And this is the ERP image with the lowest alpha power, the trials with the lowest alpha power, where we see that there is almost no signal even after the stimulus presentation. Now, this is the ERP and the intertrial coherence for these two sets of trials. We can see that the ERP shows oscillation for the data trials with high alpha, but not for the data trials with low alpha. And this is also reflected in the intertrial coherence. Here, intertrial coherence is computed over time windows in the alpha frequency band, so we can see its variation through time. The intertrial coherence is much larger for trials with high alpha than for trials with low alpha, reflecting more resynchronization of the underlying EEG with the presentation of the stimulus. What is also interesting here 
is the amplitude of the ITC reaching at about 0.4, so much lower than 1. Now remember that according to the true ERP hypothesis, ITC should always be close to 1. In general, when looking at ITC, the value will be relatively large for early ERP peaks, such as 0.8 for P1, and then decrease as time progresses with typical value for P300 between 0.3 and 0.4. Now to conclude on the ITC, it's a very useful measure to go beyond the simple trial average. It was instrumental in showing that the true ERP hypothesis was another simplification that ignored important variability in single trials. The ITC allows to determine how the EEG gets affected by presentation of stimuli. I want to thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video.